obviously we could spend hours talking about Globus, but we have 15 minutes of just high level discussion and maybe we have 15 minutes because there may not be a lot to talk about. Uh, it's been known since ancient times. Uh, globe, uh, globus is a ball in Latin and it's basically a sensation of a painless lump in the throat located between the larynx and the sternal notch. It may be associated with a feeling of tightness or choking feeling. In the 1700s, it was coined as globus hystericus, meaning a choking sensation as a lump in the throat to which hysterical persons are subject, meaning that there was an emotional component to globus. And in the 60s, Malcolmson coined the term globus pharyngeus to emphasize that most patients of globus sensation did not have a hysterical personality, but we know there is some emotional component to this disorder. We should probably just remember the Rome 4 criteria which essentially makes it a diagnosis of exclusion. So according to the criteria, globus is a persistent or intermittent non-painful sensation of a lump or foreign body in the throat with no structural lesion identified on physical exam, laryngoscopy or endoscopy. So basically it's sensation that's present between meals, not during swallowing, no dysphagia or dynophagia. And in fact, you have to rule out gastric inlet patch uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and esophageal motor disorders. So we're just going to go through the uh, algorithm for management of globus. From the ENT perspective, obviously, this is a very common disorder that we see. We see about 4% of our uh, outpatient consults are for globus. And we will do a laryngoscopy just to rule out benign tumors, cancer, laryngitis, granuloma. All of these things have actually been associated with globus. Um, I used to always send patients for a modified barium swallow just to look for upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. Uh, recently, I've been questioning whether MBSS is better or manometry is better. So that's another point for discussion. But we, we, we do want to kind of rule out UES dysfunction, although that's also kind of controversial, whether UES is, a, is, a, is, a, is an abnormal in patients with globus. Um, Typically, I would do a th uh, neck exam to rule out any thyroid disorders, uh, but if you'll the next slides I'll present shows there is some association with thyroid disease, so you may want to consider doing a thyroid ultrasound or a neck CT scan if you don't feel so comfortable with your uh, neck exam. So is globus pharyngeus suggestive of laryngeal disease, right? And the main thing we talk about is whether or not it's laryngopharyngeal reflux. I think it's the same spectrum as GERD anyway, because we tend to treat patients with PPI as the first step. And uh, there are lots of studies on empiric treatment with PPI. And patients with GERD symptoms are, are more likely to respond to PPI, which doesn't, is not surprising. Patients with longer symptom duration, more than three months, were less likely to respond to PPI. Another study showed uh, 122 patients with primary symptom of globus, uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux was diagnosed endoscopically in 16% and post-infectious inflammation in 11% and there was no uh, cancer diagnosis or anything more serious. There is some association with LPR in the literature. Sorry, next one. Well, I would add one last one, Hamdan showed that there is also a subset of patients who have dysphonia and globus, and they tend to have muscular tension dysphonia. We don't actually see any particular uh, abnormal diagnoses. Lastly, uh, in terms of thyroid disease, a study by Fukuhara showed uh, they did an all cervical ultrasound in 74 patients, globus uh, symptoms, and found 41 patients with thyroid abnormalities, mostly nodules and thyroiditis. Study by Kara Hate showed patients with thyroiditis are more likely to have globus than patients without thyroiditis. Consorti uh, published on thyroidectomy, improving globus symptoms as measured by the GET score. And NAM identified thyroid nodules more than three centimeters anterior to the trachea as correlating with globus. So there appears to be some correlation between thyroid disease and globus symptoms and some potentially correlation with laryngopharyngeal reflux. And in general, general if this is a, uh, a symptom that is midline between the larynx and the uh, sternal notch, after our laryngoscopy, we often send uh, our patients to our GI colleagues for evaluation of esophagus. And that'll be Dr. Conklin. All right, thank you very much for staying around, that's great. 
Usually everybody leaves before the last talk. Um, I'm gonna pick this up with the uh, basically GI esophageal evaluation of Globus. The, the Rome 4 criteria really tell you that you get to do all the procedures, right? If you think about it. And the, it's a little bit murky what the data are. And I'm gonna try to relate that to you just, it, as we go along here. So after the ENT evaluation is normal, then what we do next is we ask, is there a sign that there's something really wrong? Is there a, a warning sign? And if there is, you go to uh, endoscopy. If not, it's reasonable to try a treatment trial. There are a number of studies uh, asking the question, uh, is there an association of globus with GERD? Uh, and if you look in a column, right? Oh, I guess that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you, the globus uh, prevalence in groups with GERD symptoms, Oh, basically overall uh, hover around 20%. And the globus present, uh, uh, prevalence in groups without GERD symptoms are hovering around 5%. So there does look like there's an association. But remember for reference here that uh, GERD is uh, prevalent in 10 to 20% of the population just for reference. So a couple of studies, the first study here uh, the majority of patients with globus had symptom improvement after PPI treatment compared to placebo. So it was 68 to 32. Uh, another study looking at the same sort of thing by Mike Vasey. I have to tell you that Mike is a friend and he is one of the, probably the best clinical investigators in this area. He found no difference in improvement of globus between PPI and placebo. Uh, Sin et al. found no relationship between the improvement of globus and of typical GERD symptoms. So we're, here's some of the murky water. They're, they're contradictory sorts of things. But despite the confusing, confusing data, a PPI trial is a reasonable thing to do because PPI is really safe. So if there are alarm symptoms, we go to endoscopy, and I'm really going to only focus on uh, one thing, uh, which is an endoscopic finding. We all know that if they have cancer or a stricture or barrett esophagus, whatever, you're going to manage that. But the thing that's a little bit newer on the horizon is uh, a, an inlet patch. You've all seen them. They're at the top of the esophagus. Uh, the prevalence rates uh, of globus without an inlet patch is anywhere from 0.3 to 7%. Uh, with the inlet patch, it is 1.6 to 23%. There's quite a bit of overlap there, but if you look at all the numbers, it suggests that there is a relationship. On the right is a study that looks at what happens if you ablate the inlet patch. So uh, globus, and an analog uh, scale before ablating the inlet patch, there are uh, significant symptoms. And eight weeks after the ablation, you see um, a nice drop to almost all of them without globus whatsoever. So endoscopy is taken care of. What's next? Well, we can do a manometry. And really the purpose here is to look for major motor disorders that we can treat, not minor things. So if we look at the literature, again, actually quite murky. There are 12 studies out there. Um, unfortunately, they're over a long period of time. So there are a lot of different technologies that have been employed. That is some people use perfused catheters, other people use uh, sensors that are three to five centimeters apart. So only two of the studies used what we do now, which is high resolution manometry. In addition, there are the variations uh, in definitions from study to study, and the analytical schemes are quite different. Only three of the 12 studies used the Chicago classification, which has become the standard for reading manometries now. And if you look in the table, you'll see that there's a broad 
variation in what's been reported as a percentage of people with uh, motility disorders and globus. Uh, um, uh, for, first and probably the most commonly is, is normal. Uh, sec is, second is the uh, ineffective esophageal motility. Uh, this is actually a quite common abnormality. It's a minor abnormality of uh, GI uh, esophageal motility. And there are lots of people walking around the face of this earth who have this kind of motor function and no symptoms. So it's not something that we want to ascribe globus to. Uh, as I said a, a second ago, we do the manometries looking for uh, major disorders of esophageal motor function like achalasia, diffuse spasm. Uh, nutcracker in this list, we don't use that term anymore. And a lot of these people with nutcracker defined in the past are probably normal. And then the last is the or hypertensive lower esophageal sphincter. All right, next, the manometry is normal. We go, we go to pH testing. Is that, are there a lot of data to support that? Well, pathological uh, esophageal and or pharyngeal acid exposure during 24 hour pH monitoring has been reported uh, in zero to 77% of patients with globus. So again, sort of murky numbers. The prevalence of globus in uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux ranges from nine to 72, same problem, huge variability. Uh, so basically for every study showing a positive relationship between esophageal acid exposure and globus, there's at least one if not more refuting that. So are the data good? They're not, but the current recommendation still remains the same. You do the pH study looking for uh, reflux that you can treat in one, one way or another from all the people on this stage. So finally, we get to every, everything else has been sort of proven not to be the cause. We end up with functional disease. You've heard a lot about functional disease today. Uh, so there's probably globus by itself is really a functional disorder. And there've been a couple of inter interesting studies done to look at this. This is a neat little study that was done. The, these authors put a little balloon uh, in the esophagus and blew it up. And they measured first sensation in the esophagus and pain. And on the left is the first sensation. The solid line is globus patients. The dotted line is normal patients. And you can see that the globus patients sense the balloon inflation with smaller volumes, and the same was true for pain. So there's evidence here that this is really a hypersensitivity problem and a brain-gut axis problem. These, these authors also did another very interesting thing. They asked the patient where they sensed the, the, the symptom of discomfort or globus. And what they saw was that in people who were normal, blowing up the balloon was sensed substernally or doing electrical stimulation of the esophagus was sensed substernally. In the globus patients, it was in the location of their globus. So this is arguing that there's a problem with uh, communication between the brain and the esophagus. Well, what about treatments for this for hypersensitivity problems or brain gut problems? There are some complementary uh, treatments that have been used, but most important is talking to your patient. It turns out that half of these folks, if you just talk with them and explain there's nothing terrible, they get better. Amazing. So 90% of uh, Globus patients improved with hypnotherapy in at least one small study. You can see uh, on the left-hand side here, the data from that study. And there are now techniques that our speech language pathologists are starting to use to treat these folks. And we will be embarking upon this journey at UCLA pretty soon.
And then finally, what about neuromodulators? You've heard some uh, information about neuromodulators today. Uh, this is a study using amitriptyline compared to pantoprazole for the treatment of globus. And what you see is uh, four weeks after initiation of amitriptyline, there's a good response. Uh, with pantoprazole, there is a response, but it's not quite as good. So there are data to support the idea that neuromodulators may be appropriate in the treatment of globus. So back to our uh, algorithm, I guess this is the way today we should be uh, studying patients with globus. And, and I have to tell you that my own personal bias, having seen tons of these patients, and I don't know about uh, Dinesh or any of the other panelists here, but I think almost all of these people have functional disease. What do you guys think? You're all shaking their heads, sort of, yeah. I think, I mean, by the time patients come to us, they've already had the PPI trial and many of the evaluations. So I think what we see is a lot of functional yeah. disorders. So with that, uh, I guess we're gonna open up to questions and answers. Thank you.